Gail, thanks very much. It's six minutes to nine. Would you take health advice from your hairdresser or lifestyle tips from a barman? It might sound far-fetched, but a report today says we can't just rely on NHS staff to look after the health of the nation. Instead, the Royal Society for Public Health is calling on workers from a range of sectors, including librarians, cleaners, bar staff, firefighters, to spread public health messages in the hope that that could keep some people out of GP surgeries and hospitals. As breakfast, Jane McCubbin now reports. So how's things, Boxer? Yeah, all well, good, man, you know, to yeah. live in surviving. Jay's Barbers in Birmingham is at the heart of the community. You must get it all coming through these doors, Jay. We get all sorts coming through these doors, so they feel better when they talk about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A report out today says people like Jay should be harnessed and trained <laughs> to help spread public health messages. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Jay's a good listener and is, is a guy that gives gives good advice. It's true, man. It's true. I'm not just a barber. A barber slash therapist. Slash yes. agony <laughs> and slash <laughs> consultant. Oh, gosh. <laughs> the vision is a public health workforce of millions of people like Jay. Who wants that? <laughs> there are 15 million people in the UK who have the opportunity to help and support, improve and protect, actually, Out the public Out in communities health. like this, Out not in, like in this. the doctor's surgeries, no. not in the hospitals. No, people in all sorts of occupations that you might not actually think of. Some will say, shouldn't we just spend more on allowing the professionals to do their job? Well, I don't think this is about doing it on the cheap. It's about who's actually in the community talking to people. Do you see the same faces over and over again? In this city centre, bookmakers Alex tells me he's talking to regular clients on a regular basis. Yeah, I do consider a lot of people here yeah, like good, good friends, and so if someone opened up to me, then, then that's something that I've, I've got to respect and, and deal with. Yeah. Amongst his customers today is Simon. He tells me he's homeless, a paranoid schizophrenic, a manic depressive. You pop in and out of here regularly. I mean, the people yeah. you see here, do you see them more than your GP? Yeah. Do you ever see a GP? No. Free ground. The company say they already train staff to help clients with mental health issues, exactly the kind of help the report calls for much more of. I've got to say, Alex, that there'll be people watching who think the last place I want to take mental health advice from is the bookies. Sure, I mean, we're not saying that we're doctors or we're qualified to actually fix the problem. What we're saying is because of the relationship that lots of our customers have with the staff, they can provide information, they can provide signposts and point them in the direction of where they will get that advice. This is big society for the health sector. Karen, who works for a local social enterprise here in Birmingham, believes it will work. It's a real good community spirit and, and if you're working in the communities, people want to help each other um, and uh, feel more comfortable with a familiar face. But the big society idea comes after big cuts. 200 million was recently sliced off the public health budget. Sources within the NHS told me this is a cheap alternative to a professional service. Report authors, though, say it is recognition the NHS can no longer do it all. Jamie Cobb in BBC News. Well, with us now is Kieran Kurt from the Royal Society of Public Health, and it's the Royal Society, of course, who've had uh, had this idea. Is it the, the notion then that your 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 that your barber, hairdresser, bar staff will offer some sort of gentle counselling, push you in the the right direction if you happen to mention a, a health issue that you have? I mean, it's slightly woolly as to what they're expected to do. That, that's exactly the idea and the concept. And it, and it is a novel concept working with such a diverse work, wider workforce, but we already know that those conversations around particular health issues are already taking place. And it's exactly um, the, the wider workforce, i.e. the barbers and the bar staff, um, feeling comfortable and confident to actually take on board the information that's being presented to them by the customer and actually through training that we can support them with, then going on to further signposting them to specialist services. So, for example, if they were dealing with and recognising a mental health issue, they can talk that through with the individual and then at the end of that conversation signpost them effectively mm. to services. What's the difference in just talking to your friends and your friends noticing that you're down or perhaps you have a skin blemish or, or a health issue? I mean, what makes your hairdresser or barber or bar worker qualified to 
diagnose or recognise something that could be seriously wrong with you, which perhaps should be done by nurses or GPs? We're not asking the wider workforce to take on any kind of clinical intervention. That's not what we're advocating at all and therefore not asking them to, to present diagnoses. But what we are asking them to do is recognise what the story is around health and wellbeing issues and that's where then it's so important for them to be able to connect them with the right specialist service and that might be across health and social care or indeed community services and you know when we're talking to friends and families we are seeing those as the wider workforce but from a community perspective and there's opportunities to train them as health champions and peer advocates right. to deliver those how, health how promotion many, messages. Sorry to interrupt but how many people are going to get this 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 training then? I mean, are you going to go around all the bars in the country and say, have you got anybody who wants some training? So or? in our research, what we've identified is that the wider workforce is estimated to account for 20 million people. 15 million people are in paid work work opportunities already in paid capacity and a further five million are actually unpaid carers and those who are taking on voluntary roles in delivering health promotion so there's a huge potential there and we really want to try and unlock some of that potential but in relation to those groups that are identified as those interested occupations which is very much what we're focusing on today around barbers and hairdressers you know they're already enthused and willing and want to engage in this wider workforce movement so we have their backing and we have their support and we'll be working with them in the long term now to look at what training is required for them to effectively become these peer champions on the, on the ground. Training costs money. Um, I'd be interested to know how much has been allocated towards this because this report has been supported by the Department of Health and we're well aware that it's proposing £200 million worth of cuts to, to the public health sector. Those so so where's the money being shifted from? Yeah, and I, I think, you know, we have to recognise that those cuts are being made, but this is about working with the existing workforce that's already there and building the skills and capacity across that workforce. So how much would it cost? We're in conversations about the cost at the moment, but what we do know is that the demand and the need is there. And as I said earlier, it's about working in new ways, working in integrated ways with educational partnerships to address those training issues that we know are, are wanted as part of the wider workforce movement. Lots and lots of interest from people watching mm. this sure. discussion this morning. Sure. Amanda says this devalues the role of a trained counsellor and other professionals. There's a massive difference between incidental banter and sounding things out with a stranger and getting professional advice. I don't think it necessarily devalues that role. I think it just supports the connectedness and the value of working with specialist services that are already out there. And if you can start to initiate and broker those healthy, healthy conversations, as part of a wider workforce, then I think it just strengthens the role of counsellors and specialist services and we can ensure that people are receiving the right level of support. Um, and on the other side, Trevor says people should be encouraged to talk to whoever, wherever they're comfortable, rather than being put off. And Julie says, um, as a former hairdresser, she believes her clients told her more than they ever would tell a counsellor, friend or partner. Still, many are going, to be con are going to be concerned about where that line is drawn, whether people are actually shunning their GPs or professional advice in favour of having a comfortable conversation. I think it is important to recognise that, you know, we will work with people and support people who want to take on that healthy conversation as part of a, um, a wider workforce setting. But I do think that there's a real emphasis here in building those connections with health services and ensuring that people are getting that right level and support. And it's really about optimising health and wellbeing across a local community. And it's about improving and protecting the public's health, working with the public, okay. across the public and in the public sector. Karen Kent, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Three minutes past nine. In a few minutes, we'll meet a young woman called Rowena Kincaid. She's in a documentary challenging the image of life with a terminal illness and defying doctors along the way. First, though, here's a last quick look at what's happening where you are.